What's up, peeps? Hope we're all doing well. Welcome back to the Esports Rewind. We've got a lot of spicy topics to talk about. We're going to talk about them at length. We hope you guys all enjoy it. Make sure to leave a comment down below. Are you ready, sir? Let's freaking do it. It's freaking cold in here, and we are rigid and ready. That is how I love this. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, what you guys probably expected us to talk about is certainly the uh, most controversial story from this weekend. And of course, it's with Halo. I would say all of this without opinions hopping in right off the bat is for the upcoming Halo land. All eyes are going to be on Halo. It's going to create some nice spice, some nice drama. It should be very fun. Unfortunately for Sentinels this past weekend, we did find out something that was suspected. I heard about this around a week ago when the investigation did start. I wasn't told exactly the specifics of what it might be around. And uh, all I was told, it was a, a big team. I didn't expect it to be one of your best. And by some eyes, off recent events, your best team out there in the world. But Certainly fluctuating results. Sentinels member Royal 2 has now officially been temporarily suspended until next uh, February, January? End of January. End of January for geofiltering, which uh, this whole topic got very complicated very fast. For three days straight before the tournament and all throughout the tournament, every single server that Sentinels played on was a Seattle server. If you guys don't know, there's a thing called geofiltering, which is a basic way that you can block out any server that gives you a ping over a certain amount. And people were accusing Royal 2 of using a geo filter because he's from Saskatchewan, Canada. Um, it, it, but it doesn't matter if it screws Sentinel's other teammates. It, it's a, it was specifically for Royal 2 to have a better connection to the server, basically. I know the geo filtering stuff probably goes over both you and I's head, but more or less it's when they're pinging from other locations to get a specific ping in a specific server location. And so they notice a bunch of teams notice that Sentinels were only playing on the Seattle server and not ever playing on the Texas one anymore, which is where most of these teams are from, where they have the best ping. So essentially it was making these teams they're playing against have worse ping and Sentinels really just Royal two have better connection to the server so you can perform better we won't get too much into the technical stuff but ultimately they had the hts just post about it they just came out on twitter this weekend which is probably the wildest part for most people that there was no communication behind the scenes and i mean we saw guys what like lethal frosty and snakebite all respond very surprised by the fact that hey we got nothing from anyone about this they just randomly posted yeah we're not we're not gonna be going guys just so you know like I said from the start of it, uh, I didn't have a lot of confidence in them. You know, I, I knew from what we had that they weren't taking it seriously. Uh, and that's going to be something that is an issue I s probably ongoing. When, when, the people, when the people who are the judges are also the investigators and they get to pick and choose what they do and what they think is real and what they want to look into. Um, unfortunately, you are kind of doomed from the beginning, aren't you? I will say as well, though, this was, I believe, a day or so before roster lock for the LAN event. So I have to imagine, and again, we're, we're never going to get that many responses from someone like HCS. You know, they're not going to go back and forth and explain each and every particular thing that people respond to. So when Frosty or someone responds, they're not going to respond to that tweet and say, hey, here's the breakdown of why we chose this. Right. So I have to believe they probably had a reason of like, hey, we're going to temporarily suspend one of your members who did break a rule, who has to be punished. I think a big part of the argument is how... Uh, how, how uh, I guess, stern his punishment was. You know, should it have been to the extent that it was. But he did break a rule. I think there should have been a punishment. I think a lot of people would, would have argued that, okay, you fine him and say stop doing that and maybe don't suspend him for such a long period yeah. of time. Um, but beyond that, I have to imagine that HCS had a reason of, okay, we are going to suspend one of your members. We're going to give you a day or so to find a new member if you want to participate, which this goes even further because we saw right away Sentinels members responding say, yeah, we're not going to Raleigh. We're going to contest this. We're going to kind of boycott the event because we think it's unfair. Uh, Lethal and others going out to say we are 100% not going. And that lasted all of, of like five hours. Right. It's so... I think I want to say bizarre to me that they had that such strong response immediately. And they also, I mean, that wasn't all they were saying. They were getting very spicy on the timeline. 
on stream saying, yeah, this was like rigged from the beginning. Uh, I think Snakebite called it BS in there and said, yeah, I knew it was always doomed when the people who are in charge of this investigation don't care to investigate and everything and take all of our evidence. Then, of course, we're going to be found guilty. Like, I had no faith in it to begin with. Snakebite said that? Or? Yes, Snakebite said that, which is some pretty big accusations. I think we saw one of them. I don't remember if it was Royal One or Lethal. I think it was Lethal saying that, hey, we offered to send you his PC and you guys wouldn't take it. All these accusations being thrown out about the investigation not being thorough enough and them claiming that they had evidence that would have helped them out. But then the crazy part is at the end of the day, then we see Royal 2 post about it and say, yeah, this is what happened. I just forgot to turn it off. That's my bad to the fans. Sorry to my teammates. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys later. And before he had said that, I think, and I, I we see a lot of tweets out there. I thought the general, uh, you know, census consensus out there was people disagree with the ruling. That a lot of people were very upset, saying the viewership was going to be cut in half. Like, wow, rigged for rigged for Raleigh. A lot of people were very upset, which I was actually surprised by. Uh, yeah. And the only, I think, the biggest proponent to fight back on that was someone like Snipe Down who really broke it down, like really on stream uh, leading up to all of this, released a full length video. And he was a big voice of saying, hey, like, you know, this is not something you should get away with. There should be a punishment. And I don't think we saw a lot of people agreeing with that necessarily until Royal 2 was like, right. yeah, I, I freaked up. It, it was, I want to say it was toxic overall. <laughs> the environment was people were just so angry about it and about people getting this ruling. But on the other side, People were angry about Sentinels disagreeing with it, which overall, it was just insane. Snipe Down got a little more involved than I think I would have wanted to. Like, I would have like, stayed out of it a little bit. I, you know? I think once he first brought it up, and he brought it up on stream, and people mm. saw, because he admitted, like, we were one of the teams. There were several top teams who right. accused him of this. So I think he got himself involved in a situation that was like, okay, it's my duty to explain myself. Mm. And I think he did a great job in doing that. He kind of got him, he got himself wrapped up in some grade A drama. And you yeah. got to imagine a lot of Sentinels fanboys. And, and viewers are probably not happy with him. So he's like, hey, I'm, I'm going to go to great length yeah. to explain that he cheated or he broke the rules and deserves a punishment. Is Snipe Down now going to be the, the Tommy of the Halo scene where he's he has to break them. everything down? I don't know. But a little bit of a pivot here so we can combine stories, I think. We saw, like you said, they 100% were not going to Raleigh. And now suddenly, off of that, we have Formal saying that he is competing with the Sentinels in Raleigh, which is wild. The only thing I'll say because they're in the open bracket. <laughs> yes, the formal effect, you might say. For me in this situation, if you guys were not aware of this, formal clearly with Optic and Envy still, but he was actually playing with Space Station, had signed with them, and then all of a sudden you have a ruling that freaking hurts Sentinels, somehow also hurts Space Station. For me, the first thought in my mind was, that sucks for SSG. They've now actually signed Tusk, so they replaced formal, but still, you had to do it like j just this close to the event, and of right. course... I can't get over the fact that Sentinel's fricked up. Royal 2 fricked up, fricked over his team for this event and got himself suspended. And somehow the SSG guys are the ones that are probably more greatly impacted. Right. And now comes a giant question of can you blame someone like Formal when you are going to be at, I, I would say, the biggest Halo event of the past five years, um, if not to date with the number of teams and the number of eyes currently on this eSport. And you have the chance to play with not only the most controversial lineup now, but one of the most tenured and successful rosters of all time in Halo. And they're like, hey, Formal, like you want to come play for us and have a chance to possibly do better than SSG, who are still a solid team. Right. But how do you deny playing with a, a world-renowned ro roster like that? I, I didn't think of this until just now, and I'm not familiar with all the rules behind the scenes, but I'm curious how it's allowed for a player to switch rosters because isn't he learning all their strats for all the maps and what, how the players play? I mean, he's playing with them all the time. I assume scrimming with them. Yeah. And so he knows what their comms are like. And now right before an event, he switches over to another team. No, no, no. You, you make an insanely great point that I think a lot of people are afraid to bring up because you'd be technically like going against formal. I think it's fine to talk about, but I think it, it, people nowadays online, if you talk about these things, they're like, you, you hate formal. Right. Like you're trying to get him banned from the event. No, I agree. Like if this was, this is a big event. Yeah. This is a gigantic LAN event. If this was for, let's say a, a CSGO event or a Valorant event for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And all of a sudden, a couple of days before you have people switching on major teams, right. there would be a bit more fuss in my yeah. opinion. I think even beyond that, you would think, and uh, Snipe Down brought this up. It's a joke, obviously, but other more established uh, TOs and esports would never allow this to happen because 
Formal is still tied to Optic. That's a direct conflict of interest, and yeah. they could be competing against each other at the event, that being Sentinels and Optic. So other TOs in more established esports, this is this has been like barred in the past. Right. There, I feel like there's so many conflicts of interest, honestly, at this point that I don't I mean, I just <laughs> want to be comfortable. But we saw Hasher tweet about it too, you know? Yeah. He directly addressed it and he said, Hey, this was a great opportunity for formal, and we're not gonna, you know, stop him from taking an opportunity that's good for him. And of course, he went on to brag about like how many optic players they have everywhere. Which, to your point, is like, hmm, that seems a little bit. You can sketchy. only have so many, man. All <laughs> right. right. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that formal would freaking throw. Okay, I'm not saying that, guys. I'm saying that in other esports, that this would not be allowed to happen in the first place. I think it also, though, you know, despite that, it makes for some great storylines if they do match up and formal does take them down. Oh my god! Like I love that. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately for me, at the end of all of this, I think it's a very controversial uh, suspension of Royal Two. But I was leaning towards the side of if you break the rules, you deserve a punishment. I'm not sure this punishment was justified to the rules he broke, but hey, that's not for me to to try and argue too much. And then very lastly, I just feel bad for SSG. You know, I've talked with, uh, uh, you know, Sean from over there. I just feel mm -hmm. bad. Like they were so excited to get formal. And then you can't predict like, hey, formal, come play with us. This is awesome. You can't predict then one of the best teams in the world breaking the rules, needing a player and formal being like, <laughs> Peace. Like, I, I think the one thing that we talked about that I find hilarious is the fact that they're going to be playing some randoms now. Some guys, oh some God. you know, buddies from college that were actually pretty sick at Halo, and they got tickets to Raleigh, and now they first up they match against Formal and the rest of the Sentinels roster. It's like, man, Dude, I'm got, going home. You got a <laughs> random group of friends, like you said, college buddies, high school buddies. They come all the way from Texas or Cal California, or Utah, middle of bumfrick nowhere. It's their first ever LAN event. They somehow actually got a team pass before they sold out in 38 minutes or whatever. Probably a little hungover from the night before. Yeah, they're like, this is our, this is our freaking weekend. Show up, uh, open bracket gets released, it's just Sentinels. Hey guys, is this right? Are you sure about this? Like we're, we're in the open bracket. Like, yeah, I that's literally going to be a storyline that I can't wait to talk about. Either way, Sentinels somehow find themselves the faces of Halo yet again, this time for some controversy. And there's a lot of tying stories, but it's going to make the HCS opening LAN event in Raleigh very, very exciting. So what do y'all think about it? Nikki Merckx has certainly been busy over the past year or so, signing the biggest deal ever in streaming and also taking a step away from the game that, well, he was very big in. That being Warzone, he's talked a lot about this, stepping away from Warzone, not going back. He's he's not going to compete. It was a, a while back he stepped down from Call of Duty events and uh, has been focusing on a brand new game. Well, not a new game, but one that he returned to in Apex Legends. It was actually in a recent video last week where Nick Merckx talks about his future in Apex Legends and kind of also responds to speculation that he was going to be stepping away from Apex <laughs> to maybe go back to Warzone. I want to, um, you know, I want to keep climbing the ranks of Predator, and then I want to get to a point where we're very comfortable, me, Deeds, and whoever we pick up as a trio uh, before late February, and then I want to go for Apex Pro. You know what I mean? That's what I want to do now. But we might get to January and that might change. I have no idea. Which you bring up a point that I forgot about that he honestly, because it's been so long that he competed in Warzone events, like mm -hmm. official ones until everything happened. And of course, he's like, yeah, I'm not playing these anymore. Cheaters are too bad. But yes, now confirming that he wants to officially compete in the AOGS next season, which is pretty crazy thinking about where Nick Merckx came from. I mean, he used to be a professional gamer. I think a lot of people forget about that at this point. Yeah. Because what? He played Gears for a while and... Was it? Was that what was that game that Ninja also played? Wasn't it Halo? <laughs> was it? Ah, oh, frick! We're gonna. I'm sound, pretty sure it was Halo. We're gonna sound dumb now because I almost said H1Z1. So. Oh well, they. Well, we he know might have been in that too. You know what? Let's just stick to this. We knew it was Gears. Yes. Way, way back in the day. And so he did compete back in the day, and now at this point, I mean, we've seen him hit Predator twice in Apex, and he wants to do it a third time, which is what he says on stream. I'm gonna hit Predator, then we're gonna go in the LGS. He has his duo deeds. I think is his name. He said we're looking to pick someone up and see what happens, which we haven't seen a lot of content creators, I don't think, really compete like this. And to jump off that last point, so starting in Gears, and we're probably missing one in there as well, but he did compete heavily in Fortnite. He competed in Warzone. So, uh, of course, now with Apex, is actually a pretty solid list, especially for a streamer. My only thing is, you know, can he really make a name for himself? Uh, if you guys remember back, I think it was, at, I can't remember what event, but back in Fortnite, he actually partnered up with uh, G2 at the time, uh, Coop, 
And so they had a fun time. I don't think they placed necessarily too well. But the thing is that when Nick Merckx is looking for a team, I'm pretty sure Coop dropped out of a, of a different trio. Uh, I believe it was trios uh, to actually play with Nick, because if you have the opportunity to play with a giant streamer, you're going to drop up some other chances. So you're going to see some hopefully top Apex players make that same kind of move of, OK, Nick Merckx is here to play. We're going to be on his stream all the time, get to interact with him and potentially still place well as on top of that. ALGS, obviously highly competitive, just like the Fortnite space was. You're going to, you're going to see a lot of uh, randoms teams that you probably did not expect to beat mm -hmm. you. And maybe you're going to take some, take on some top names too. I love that he's doing this. It also, of course, sparks the memory of Ninja and his short stint in Valorant. So whenever there's a top streamer out there who is very competitive, that takes a stab at a new esport freaking love it i think it's interesting to think about how it might affect the viewership too hopefully it affects it really well because if you're a fan of nick Merckx and he's competing in the algs then maybe you're tuning into that stream now i don't know if he'll be allowed to stream during i don't know how that works really because um, I, I thought you could actually stream your you stream during games? it and so i don't know how that'll help out the algs but you have to imagine someone like nick actually streaming that will in turn maybe bring some changes to the league because i know people have complaints about it but it also might bring just huge viewership which in turn could be you know sponsorships and really help out the scene and stuff like that an interesting point he did make live on stream also was hey yeah maybe i'll go back to warzone for like you know some of the updates the big games play every once in a while with people like tim but at the end of the day and he brings this up again i'm gonna play what i want to play which I think is just what his contract has enabled him to do at this point, where he doesn't have to worry about his viewership. Yeah. He had a massive contract. So, hey, let's explore things like, you know, playing in the AOGS. I, like, I don't know. You know, from, I, I just, I find it so respectful because I honestly, I never thought he was going to quit on this level, Warzone. Like mm -hmm. like you said, he'll be, he'll be bouncing back. But, you know, Tim the Tatman's there almost every day. Cloaksy right. and the guys are there because you know, well, Call of Duty multiplayer sucks and Halo's not the best viewership wise. So they go back to Warzone because they get huge numbers. I, I literally did think that Nick would ride the Warzone wave a lot longer yeah. than he did. So it is super exciting to see. And, uh, you know, it's also funny because he's running Apex Legends events. EA probably loves this guy right now. He's like, hey, let me do an Apex Legends event with the whole train wrecks drama, which got great viewership. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm not going to go back to Activision and Call of Duty anytime soon. I'm now going to try and go pro in your game. And I, I don't think that's a, a paid opportunity there. He's literally just pay, playing it because he loves to play it. So I'm just, I hope he does well. And if we, if he does pop off, because again, in Fortnite, certainly right. a lot of freaking competition, every esport nowadays, especially when a big streamer like Nick goes into it, you're going to probably see all the more competition flood into ALGS too. Yeah. I, it seems as if maybe he's just building connections with all these game studios. You know, Epic Games loves them. They're like, Nicky, oh, come on back yeah. to our events. And we then money. we got Activision Blizzard like, Nick, come play some more. Dude, zone. that's And now so he's, uh, you know, messing with EA. <laughs> and then that's like, so true. Like, yes. all, of a, all of a sudden, that's, dude, like, you see three months from now, he's having, like, uh, you know, he just doesn't know what to play, right? He tweets out, like, who wants me? All of a sudden, the next stream is, like, hashtag Epic Partner, hashtag COD Partner, <laughs> hashtag right. EA Games, you know? So whoever's willing to dish it out, he's made a very big note in the past that at one point he he stopped going to events unless they were maybe paying him to do the events. So you never know. His team's very smart. I hope ALGS does him well in Apex too. It's a great scene over there that we want to cover more in the future and that has certainly still has great viewership. So Nick Merckx potentially going pro in Apex Legends. Do you think he'll make it or not? Another good old spicy topic out there, bringing in some Call of Duty pros. We got some top level pros and maybe some challenger pros. And yes, we're going to talk about the one and only Doug Sensor Martin. Man, we could talk about him for about 15 minutes if we wanted to, because his last month and a half has been utterly so hectic. I'll kind of TLDR it for all of you guys. He did beat Skump in another grand finals, which was a very, very fun TST event to watch. And uh, he, the whole time, I mean, you saw the clips from it as well, him doing the pull-ups, him trash-talking Skump, beating him in the upper bracket, and then again in the grand finals. I mean, a freaking course at this point. I just remember the funniest one was when he was doing his pull-ups, and I guess his teammates didn't know, and he was just like breathing into his mic because his headset was on. And they were like, Doug, what are you doing? He's like, pull-ups. <laughs> and they're like freaking stop it <laughs> it's so funny but he has been just on an absolute another level i feel like at this point yeah and then of course there was the other clip where they actually won the grand finals and uh he <coughs> went on to say that skump can't gun him he can't effing gun him he's beat him in this many grand finals and he's been carried by he went on a, a little censored tirade beyond that as well uh recently we talked about as well he um 
He was trash talking randos on the timeline going at him. He's been had the ATS debate. He also said anyone who does not love Call of Duty Vanguard, shut up and I'm, I'm going to block you. He said he loves Call of Duty Vanguard, got backlash for that. He just keeps up. He was dropped from the do see he was dropped from the pioneers for challengers oh, yeah. because the challenger scene is going to be seeing some maybe a rougher season, which brings us into our topic for this one, which is what sensor leaked. I don't know if you saw the schedule, Chris, but there's going to be six lands this year. There's going to be a challenger versus pro LAN where challenger teams are going to play pro teams. Well, which here's is something the thing, we didn't have the last time. Is this real? Is, is that real? If, if, I'll show you the PDF, so I have the PDF if, from if the league is, if you want to if, see it. If this is we true, just, you, are we just putting news out If this is true, I don't give a damn. So he ended up leaking on the flank, which I feel like now is just a hot spot to leak everything in Call of Duty. <laughs> and obviously, Sensor does not care because it seemed as if they had just learned about it like right before. And he ended up leaking that, yes, they're going to have an amateur league that is the Challengers versus a pro land this year, which is super exciting. I feel like it's a really good thing. We'll see how maybe pros and audience members like viewership reacts to it. But at the end of the day, for me, it feels like, hey, this is something the COD scene needs when you have amateur teams and amateurs who are so hungry to prove themselves and to yeah. play against these pros. And, you know, that's just going to spark so much trash talk and so much, you know, back and forth. We're going to see Sensor play against some people, probably. Yeah, hopefully so. If, if he finds a challenger lineup, I, I would hope that he can actually participate in that because I think he's one of the big names alongside someone like uh, Parasite that I'd love to see, like, see how they stack up yeah. against the COD pros and the CDL guys. For me, I'm trying to think about in my mind how this would actually do for viewership. I think because it's a different off event, it would do better than the the standard of, like, the league where we have all these weekend uh, matchups. So I hope it would do better than your standard, like the really low ball numbers we saw last season. We saw some matches getting just over 20K to 40K if Optic and FaZe and the big names were not involved. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would hope the event could pull in those kind of numbers. I would love for a CDL versus Challenger event to allow like, I don't know, um, stream parties, viewer parties, because that would be really cool right. for viewership to see all their reactions to it. But I don't know. Like, do people actually care about challenger pros versus CDL pros unless there's some big money on the line? I I, I just don't know. I hope yeah. so. I think it'll be interesting, and this might seem like a weird side note, but seeming or going into Halo with all of these open qualifier teams and all these people who aren't anyone, like we don't know who any of these teams are. Yeah. I'm curious to see what viewership with that will be because I think people are interested. Maybe it's just me, but interested in seeing these teams like rise to the top from out of nowhere. Yeah. We have the established people. We have these storylines with some of the amateurs and especially in the COD scene, like you said, like Haggy and Sensor, who obviously have history with a lot of these people in the scene. And so, hey, how do they stack up coming back against it? It seems like like I would want to watch that more than an, I would want to watch a normal CDL match that's, you know, not finals, you know? Yeah, and I think I would like to see, I mean, once a year is great. I, I would love mm -hmm. to see, like, if you go to any eSport, uh, League of Legends Academy teams face off against the main rosters. Right. Uh, if you go to, uh, Valorant's not had an academy system, but you go to like a CSGO scene where even if it's not academy teams, but just lower tier teams, you face off against the higher tier guys. I would love to see a format like that. I think uh, these franchise leagues are a bit unique in the fact that we do see more academy or challenger rosters where we can make it happen. I think it's a great format, especially because at the end of the day, the biggest thing for me is if you are a CDL pro, are you almost scared to go to the event? Because if you are a CDL pro or a CDL team and you go to a challenger versus CDL pro event and you do not place in the top half or you do lose to a challenger roster, what's stopping your team? Because we know CDL teams like to switch up their rosters mm -hmm. all the time. What's to stop your team from being like, why are we paying you guys above league minimum to do? lose to challenger teams yeah why so not just if, pick them up so i'm just saying if i'm a cdl pro i'm like ah, i've got i'm feeling <laughs> kind of like i we probably should use a sub this weekend and then that way i can say oh, that was not me yeah. i'd be nervous as frick that's true because you got gunners dude you got challenger players who are like <gasps> like all sensor bread or just the sweatiest little kids like yeah. of all time <laughs> who have like been raised by guys who just played modern warfare 2 back in the day like, and yeah. now they have their little mini me's that you they look just over in front of it challenger guys just shotgunning red bulls like, right <laughs> i'm not losing this it's like series. red bull and bud light at the same time <laughs> <laughs> just like going hard i don't know it's also interesting i think the reason maybe <coughs> sorry that they're doing it is because it feels like CDL has just such a lack of content at this point where, <laughs> hey, there's just there's so few teams and they're playing each other and no one's really happy. And it's like, OK, let's what can we do 
to throw something in there to spice it up a little bit because no one wants to watch the same rosters compete against each other over and over again, especially in games that they're not enjoying, like Vanguard. Maybe if it was a game that people were stoked on, it'd be different. But my point is, we saw CDL Intel also tweet out saying that they were told that they're going to have four majors and only have the top eight teams attend them. And the bottom four would not attend, which is really the bottom three, as we know. Um, Champs and the amateur versus pro land would be the other two, which is crazy that only eight teams would be competing. As we know, there's only 11 in general. Yeah. And so you're thinking, are they doing that because of possible format issues? Because obviously, if you have 11 teams, you are fricked for a format. Unless you do a, a group play format where one group has one less team. And even then, you have to imagine it's formatting issues because if you guys remember last year for CDL champs, when only a certain number of not every team went to champs, mm -hmm. and that was a huge outcry of like, what? Like, at least start us out in lower bracket. Don't let us not go to champs. And now we have that for every event. It's just like, right. what are we doing here? Which, why? So last year, we see them have so much backlash. It's such a good point. And people are pissed about it. Pissed about, hey, why not just have all the teams go? We want everyone to be there. It's better for us overall. And now we move into this one where we see there's only 11 teams. So why would a, another organization want that 12th spot to field when they don't even, they're probably not going to get to play because a lot of the most established pros at this point have been have signed, been signed and yeah. are taken. So why are you going to pay and sign a roster to probably not compete if you're going to be in that bottom four? And to probably not, I mean, we have seen year in and year out several teams come away after a season with like 20 to 30 K in prize earnings total throughout mm -hmm. a $6 million year. I mean, it is a very, very top heavy league sometimes. So it seems to me. And yeah, you make a great point where if you're, a, if you're a 12 team, you're like, okay, who's left? Would they actually even go to any of the land events or major events? Okay. Um, historically speaking, I guess when you put these kind of rosters together last second, I would guess the answer is like most likely no. How about for the challenger versus CDL event? We just had the winner get the 12th spot. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Like maybe whatever the best challengers team is in that event, like whoever goes give to them a furthest, temporary league spot. Yeah. Hey, we'll give you a league spot for this season. You four get to try to prove yourself. Every org is like, why the frick did we pay 24? five million freaking dollars right. <laughs> just disband and be like all right you guys go compete <laughs> that as a roster that temporary team wins the entire cdl yeah <laughs> like, what the frick it would be wild but it's exciting nonetheless <laughs> i'm glad that since they leaked it uh supposedly according to cdl intel maybe we'll get some more information about all of this this week but we'll have to see and wait and find out you should know? be exciting and very lastly, for all you folks out there, a quick little recap of Valorant Champs as well this past weekend. I would say overall a killer event for viewership as we saw those viewer parties that other esports are so jealous of. And coming away at the end of all of it, a bit of a surprise to a lot of eyes out there. Ascend Club, now take your victory. The first thing I think about, CNED coming off the face of a gigantic controversy, turns that around into a Valorant Champs event, which again, I would say a, a fairly big upset over a gambit who was a defending champion going into uh, champs itself and a lot of things happening throughout valorant champs for those reasons i think it was an overall amazing event and this is what it comes down to one more man to stand and red guard all the hours you've put in thousands upon thousands is down to a 1v4 and it's done ascend are your valorant champions winners the first of their kind to edge their names in the history books. And they did it in the shadows, surprising so many. And they've worked so hard. There's a lot of good storylines. I think, like you said, it's a good event because they went on to prove that, hey, there are storylines that can be created during Valorant tournaments that people are like really dug into. And so, of course, uh, not too much in depth. But we saw Sentinels lose to Crew, which was huge. And we saw Crew match up against Gambit, which I don't think I have ever seen so many people pulling for a Latin American team from NA yeah. on the timeline. So many people were so invested in that, saying like it was one of the best matches they'd ever watched. We went into multiple overtimes, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was, I think it was five. I watched uh, yeah, it. I, can't I don't remember. know how many there were. And so it went into a lot of overtimes. People were really pulling for Crew and saying it was a heartbreaking loss. And then, of course, we see Gambit in a Sin match up which was also a pretty good match although i feel like more people are going to say that 
crew versus yeah, Gambit was better. I think that semifinal matchup could have easily been a finals, yeah. but either way, I mean, there are so many storylines. Besides, of course, remember the whole COVID scare throughout the entire thing. All eyes on, okay, what players did some things that maybe they should not have done? Did someone mm. break protocols? Uh, beyond that, you have Zoms versus all of Brazil. That sparked the whole new thing where once all the Brazilian teams were out, then it became the Argentinian team of crew, the Latin American team as well, uh, to become like the new face of like, all right, that's our team. Right. And then, of course, once crew took out Sentinels, all North America was like, okay, uh, you took out now our uh, well, one of our last teams, right? Once North America Hope was all dead and Crew was still alive, they were like, okay, Crew took out Sentinels, so if Crew wins the whole thing. NA still kind of kind of has a a win too. So it, it was amazing to see. And then of course you have CNED, uh, a gigantically well known name, and I think a lot of people have kind of brushed over the controversy that led up to champs, which uh, Riot never got an official response on. That's going to probably be a lengthy, lengthy investigation. But, you know, CNED was was a name in that whole thing, and I'm glad that they turned that around and now come away as Valorant champs. Uh, not a team that I would have predicted. I think Gambit would have been one of your favorites, and I was certainly a North American Sentinels fanboy, and that was another storyline where they go out in groups, and things are probably going to shake up for Sentinels and a lot of teams out there. And then very lastly, sorry, a lot of points, mm -hmm. is we now probably have North American teams starting to supposedly import players because that's what we do best. I, I don't, how can we compete? Let's just bring in people who aren't <laughs> from here. I don't know. But it was weird. I didn't know who to pool for necessarily because, what we had a Russian team and an EU team competing against each other for the finals. I was like, just make it a good game. I know, exactly, which I think where most people were. And it really was a good game. We had a lot of those rounds that were very back and forth. We had, I mean, I think it was like Zeke really showing up in some rounds. Uh, of course, CNED's, like you said, Nats, what do they call them? No access to sight. <laughs> so I thought Gambit was going to win. Yeah? Yeah. I think overall, I don't know, what in that last match in the overtime, I'm trying to remember what happened. Was it... A gambit who was up first in a sin who was down or was a sin leading the whole You're time? You're asking the wrong guy. Okay, it's okay. I just we both have one of the worst memories of all time. But I just remember being back and forth, and I was making Samantha watch it with me on the couch, and I was like, I have no idea what was gonna happen. She kept asking me all these questions, like, who's gonna win? Is that good? I'm like, yeah, that was good, but I don't really know how it's gonna go, <laughs> which I think is the way, like, why Valorant is so exciting. Something like, yes, of course it can snowball, but when we see other esports like uh, we'll say League of Legends that can really snowball a lot. And you can kind of figure out who's going to win most of the time in League pretty early on, like yeah. in the first 10 yeah. to 15 minutes. But with something like Valorant in these matches and seeing, you know, five overtimes in the other match, this final is going to overtime. The 9-3 curse. It really goes to show like, hey, people can really come back if they play their cards right. Mm -hmm. And one t like person on a team can really make all the difference. And I think, I mean, they did a great job avoiding key players, depending on which team you're on. And overall, it was an exciting match for me. Yeah, it was still super exciting, despite not having a horse in that race at the very end. So congrats to Ascend. And beyond that, a lot of great storylines as well. We're hearing a lot of uh, roster movements out there, some very expensive North American players making some other uh, changes be made by teams out there. And hey, uh, maybe a team who just won champs, who at one point was rumored to maybe be getting rid of their roster. We'll see if they're now reevaluating what they do as an organization too. So a great, great storyline. I am heartbroken for Gambit though, because they reached a semifinal in a CSGO major and now a grand finals for Valorant champs and come away with nothing this year. And two, they of course had a great year um, winning a, a different Valorant event either way. But still, when it comes to the culminating events of esports and being still a very, very much, I would say your number one FPS organization falling short yet again, hopefully Gambit does stick it together and uh, we'll see what they can do next year instead. Congrats to Ascend, your Valorant champs. And on a bit of a more serious note for all you listeners out there, we are actually, well, you're not going to be seeing us next week on the podcast. The podcast is going to be taking a bit of a step back for a bit of a revamping and changing with some things underway, but hopefully we'll be back sometime in the future for all of you guys. We do love you guys, and we'll see you sometime. Until next time, y'all take care, and uh, bye. Bye.